the super rich and corporations are perpetrating, or, or I'm sorry, are perverting uh, our government to serve their needs rather than the common good of the American people. Yeah. Yes. That's sad. Definitely. I have a question on that. Okay. I have friends that tilt this way. And their comments to me repeatedly are, do you mean all corporations or do you mean, uh, do you just want to, do you just wish all the state of having a corporation would disappear? And I'd like, well. Um, actually, I, did I, I don't know if I read that uh, as I have it written, but I wrote the super rich and huge corporation. Oh, I didn't hear the huge. I may not have said that. Okay. I may have missed that. Okay. But, but I, I did write that down. But, but I would, would, there could be a huge corporation that is doing some good things. Unfortunately, um, the malignant things don't, it doesn't balance. And the rules affect yeah. all the corporations, not just yeah. the big No, I agree with that. I don't, <laughs> but it's a, it's a valid question. It's a fair question mm -hmm. that deserves an answer, so. Um, and then, and, and there's different approaches to how to deal with that, and, and, and what we can do, we'll talk about that in the what we can do uh, kind of section. I encourage you to come up as close as you can uh, so that we can all hear each other. And this chair is available if someone wants to take take this. I would love that chair. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so um, here's a quote from uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and you, many of you may be familiar with this one. Actually, I've got two quotes, but I'm going to read this one first. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combi combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. That was uh, stated around, um, I don't know, in the 50s. I'm, I'm forget, I don't have the exact date of that speech. It was 1961. It was the last speech. It, yeah, I, that was his farewell address. Yeah. So, so what was it? It was, it was January of 1961. I don't know okay. the exact date. But thank thank yeah, you, Mike. Right before Kennedy got sworn in. Um, is that the same speech where he says every bomb that drops? Nope. It? No, that's I got that. That one's coming okay. later. Because um, that's an important, uh, important words as well. Um, and then here's another one. This is from Dr. Martin Luther King. This was during the Vietnam War. A few years ago, there was a shining moment in that struggle. It seemed as if there was real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. Then came the buildup in Vietnam, and I watched this program broken and eviscerated as if there were some idle, it was some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. And I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energy in the rehabilitation of its poor so long as adventures like Vietnam continue to draw men and skills and money like some demonic, destructive suction tube. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor and to attack it as such. So those, I think, two quotes um, decades ago, I think, still are with us. 
and you know very very sadly um, ring very true. I um, uh, do some workshops uh, with youth on uh, uh, leadership and social action and cha uh, change and organizing and one of the exercises that I like to do sometimes is called star power and it's an exercise where we give uh, different numbers of coins, plastic coins, uh, to people. Some people have three or four coins, other people have, you know, eight or ten coins. And then we play this little game and you flip your coin and the winner gets, wins one of the coins and you do that for a few minutes and then you stop and then you divide the people into the group of people who have, you know, eight or more coins and the group of people who have fewer. And then I ball out the people who have fewer coins and say, why don't you get your act together and become productive members of this society? If you'd only work harder, you could be, do it, you could be uh, having more wealth and contributing more to society. And then I go to the other group and I say, you're such stellar members of this society, you're so productive and moral and good, you get to make the rules for the next round of the game. <laughs> <laughs> and so they make the next ra rules for the next round, and this time, if you happen to have more than eight coins, you get a two-for-one match when you win. And what happens, and then we play another round, and guess what happens? The poor are poorer, and the rich are richer. And then they make up some more rules. And the rules get more and more extreme, and more and more beneficial to the rich. Hmm. And let me ask you, um, why would I present such a preposterous game? Because that's exactly what's going on in this film. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I was looking this up while you, you mentioned this. There was an article published on New Science Magazine the title of it is Reveal the Capitalist Network that Runs the World. That win runs the that world? runs the world. It's by Andy Coughlin and uh, Deborah McKenzie. And the economic model that they examine points out that this structure would have existed even with the absence of intent. Okay? So, I mean, it's not necessary to look at motive alone. You know, I mean, I think businessmen are like-minded. I think they see an economic opportunity to leverage the current situation. But even if they had no malice, supposedly with the current system in place, this would be the natural consequence given time anyway. I, I would beg to differ, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. I kind of look at corporations as not inherently evil. Okay. I think that's what I said, though, isn't it? I, I look at them as entities that function within the habitat that they, that they live. Okay. And, and what has happened is that corporations have, have taken control of the rules of their habitat. If, if uh, as um, Eisenhower said, the only protection um, is an alert and knowledgeable citizenry, and I think Jefferson said that democracy is only uh, protected with a, an educated electorate, that failing those things, then corporations make up their own rules. And the, the, if there's any evil in corporations, it is the narrow-mindedness uh, of their mission, which is to maximize profit with no moral or ethical concern. I, I, can I say one last thing to clarify my position? I think that's a byproduct of business ethics. And business ethics is a poor substitute for morality. Or a lack of business right. ethics. But, 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 but I'm not defending the status quo. Right. No, but I, I, I understand how uh, um, those authors within a certain context or uh, uh, legal environment would say that, that, that this corporate domination is inevitable, but I, don't, I think that with an alert electorate, electorate an electorate that is active and, and uh, in more control of their democracy, that the rules would be such that the external costs of, their of the corporate behavior would be, would be put upon the corporations 
and uh, they wouldn't be able to profit at the expense of everyone else. I agree. So there should be a check. But, but so I, I guess I was I was sensing a hopelessness in that research piece that I don't think I think we're hopeless enough <laughs> that we don't we don't need to uh, expect that it's inevitable.